Good. So, do you hear me? And do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Super. So let me start by saying thanks to, to the organizer and to Nico, of course, for, for putting together this program. So I would love to, to be there and hopefully I will, I will visit uh, you guys in, in a near future. So I will speak about these molecules that are uh, quite different in the sense that they contain nuclei that are radioactive that we call exotic or rare in US. And this is interesting because it allows us to investigate nuclear phenomena that so far is poorly known. And it connects low energy nuclear physics with high energy nuclear physics. That's because I select a nuclear science in general with several applications. And I will concentrate on the nuclear science, but I will briefly show that it's useful also for quantum chemistry or astrophysics. So before I go into the details of the presentation, I would like to thank the, the, the people that make this work possible. So that's the, the Chris collaboration at Isolde. And we have a, a strong support from the theoretical side. And the theoretical quantum chemistry has been really important to guide experiments. So they motivated the experiment and, and have been with us guiding through the process because no much is known about these kind of molecules. In fact, nothing was known before of Chorley radioactive molecules. So here's the, the plan for the talk. So first, uh, I will say a few words for the motivation, why it's interesting to study these molecules, who are the big questions that we'd like to study. Then I will focus on, on, see, yeah. the, on radium fluoride, that is a, a molecule that is particularly interesting for us some results that we already have in this direction. And finally, the summary and outlook. So as a nuclear physicist, at least in the low energy side, we have some common questions. And I think these were common, uh, has been common in, in this workshop. So we, we want to answer this question so to understand the nuclear many body problem. And most of the proofs that we have so far are electromagnetic proofs. So we, we have been learning mainly about the nuclear electromagnetic structure. So you have seen talks about how we measure B2, very beautiful techniques, uh, spectroscopy factors, quadruple moment, radio, and so on. And from our side, I mean from the precision experiments in atoms and molecules, we can contribute to this effort by measuring these observables, the radius, the, the nuclear spin, the magnetic moment and quadruple moment, taking advantage to the fact that when, once you put electrons around a nucleus, then it interacts with the electromagnetic interaction, mainly dominated by that. And any modification of the structure of nuclei will cause a perturbation of the electron energy levels. And we have been using this technique for many years, it, far before my time at Isolde. And this I, I highlight in here, just a, a few results that in which I have been involved mainly as far as uh, collapse and Chris collaboration, using the atoms to understand the nuclear. And we focus mainly, this is just a few highlights, we have been focused mainly in the calcium, nickel, and tin region around this, what we call doubly magic nuclei, and very beautiful results. Now recently in calcium, nickel, and thin, so I mean, recent in the last two, three, or four years. So this is great, and it will continue revealing new phenomena. It will continue. It's, it's a, a very powerful tool that will continue giving us an understanding of nuclear structure far away from stability. But on the other side, the electroweak structure nuclei is poorly known. So we don't have good proofs to, to be sensitive, of, at least to do precision experiments of electroweak observables. And once we put an electron in an atom and a molecule, so there will be also an interaction like C boson exchange, right? Or hadronic parity violation, CW boson exchange inside the nucleus can create currents that survive inside the nucleus and the electron can penetrate the nucleus and interact with these currents. And why not? And there might be new forces that we don't know yet, 
that can modify these interactions, right? Uh, new particles connecting, new forces connecting the electron and the nucleus. So this is by itself interesting because it tells us about the electroweak structure of the nucleus that is poorly known, but also the weak force, you know, is the only force that violates parity uh, and investigating the violation of these fundamental symmetries can, you know, can, has been proposed as a way to look for beyond standard model physics. We know that by, by the violation of symmetries like time reversal violation are necessary conditions to explain the matter antimatter asymmetry of the universe. And we need to understand very well the electromagnetic and the electroweak structure, even within the standard model, to use that to constrain the existence of new physics beyond the standard model. So by itself, it's, it's, it provides a complementary information for low energy nuclear physics, but also allow us to, to study high energy physics. So now why we'll try to convince you is that molecules will allow us to access to this, to the electroweak structure of nuclei, really giving a new window into the exploration, the exploration of the atomic nuclei. And the cartoon picture, as I like to see that, is that we want to access to a nuclear, right? One of the main challenges is that, that these interactions are short range, right? The, the, the C bosons of you are very heavy, right? The, the range of the interaction is below the 0.1 Fermi. So we are speaking about interactions that happen at the nucleus or inside the nucleus. And in an atoms, in, in atoms, the electrons are mainly away from the nucleus, right? We are sensitive mainly to the long range part of the interaction. There are some orbits like the S orbit that has a probability to enter inside to overlap with the nucleus, but they have a spherical symmetry. So they teach us mainly about the, the size of the nucleus. It's very hard to learn something beyond that. But you can do something like that. You can go to an atom with an S orbit like radium and put an atom next to it. And now the S orbit in the atom becomes a sigma orbit in the molecule. So you, you deform this orbit. So now the S orbit is no longer, the sigma is no longer spherical. So it has a, a kind of a combination between states of different party S and P, and still you keep a good overlap with the nucleus. That's great because then you can learn something beyond the spherical symmetry. You can learn something about the currents inside the nucleus. So to quantify that a bit better, so if you don't include the weak interaction, states in nature have well-defined parity, right? In atoms, molecules, nuclei. But once you include the weak interaction, these states will have a small contribution of the states of different parity. And this contribution depends on the, the matrix elements that connects this to a state, the symmetry violating part, and in the denominator, the energy difference between those states of different parity. In atoms, these states are naturally in the electron ball scales. But in molecules, the energy difference between a hen states of different parity is about 10 to the pi smaller. It means that you naturally amplify parity violation of this mixing by 10 to the pi. And they are so close in energy that you can actually apply a magnetic field of a few Tesla, something that you can get in the lab to bring those two states to zero, to close as good as you can control zero. And groups like David Emil have shown and people working in molecular spectroscopy that an enhancement of more than 10 to the 11 is possible. Nobody has measured parity violation in a molecule, but we have strong indications that this enhancement is possible. At factor of 10 is good, a factor of 10 to the five is amazing, a factor of 10 to the 11 really make what we thought would be impossible in atoms become very possible in molecules. And for similar reasons, you can take these molecules, apply an, a weak electric field, and easily polarize the molecule and produce a gigantic electric field inside the molecule. Gigantic here being of the order of 80 gigavolts per centimeter. And this is very useful for me measuring things like electron EBM, right? That is, is an indication of T violation. It's, it's, it's a very interesting observable. We saw some talks are mentioning that. And if there is an electron in the end, then it can interact with this gigantic electric field and shift the energy levels in the molecule. 
And in dead molecules are being quite famous for that, and these figures summarize it. So you can plot the electron in the end constraints, and the different bands here are different extensions of the standard model, right? Supersymmetric models, something that's called generic models. Don't ask me about the details because I just don't know, but I, it's mandatory to show this figure for people working in molecules because it shows the power of molecules. So the atoms were the main systems constraining this electron EDM in, up to, let's say, 20 years ago. But since about less than 10 years ago, molecules took over this field. And they have been improving and improving the electron EDM constraints. Now at the point that they can already start ruling out supersymmetric models, if you want to, to put that in an energy scale, you are testing physics at the TV scale. And there are many ideas to go far beyond the TV scales to the PV scales, like much more than you can even get in, in large hadron collider. So we are mainly interested in the hadronic part, right? Electron EVMs is of course very interesting, but as I said, nuclear physicists, we can contribute mainly in the hadronic part because I spoke about the, the amplification in molecules, but at the nuclear level, there is also a way to amplify the symmetry violation. And you see that the symmetry violating terms, this part here is scaled with the atomic number and the mass number to some powers, the nuclear quadruple and octuple deformation, and also something similar. You have uh, the energy difference between the eigen states of different particles, but now in the nuclear case. And we have seen talks like Lian, uh, the work of Peter Buchler of this morning with the thorium, where there are some special nuclei where you can amplify all of these at once. You can get to large C, A, Q, 2, 3, and minimize the energy difference. So overall, you can have amplification of more than 10 to the 3 in cases like radium. Uh, some people speak about more than 10 to the 5 in cases like protactin. So the question that we ask in our work is what happens when, when we now put an, an atom, or a nucleus of this, this interesting nuclei, inside a molecule? So then on paper, we can take out combined advantage of this molecular and nuclear amplification. So if you multiply this order of magnitude, the two together on paper, it's not like amazing, right? A, a unique system that will allow you to study the, the violation of these fundamental symmetries. So exotic molecules really take the very best of all worlds. This is great, but experimentally are unknown. So previous to our work, not much was known, and certainly nothing was known about the structure of molecules containing this, this kind of nuclei. And this motivated us to start this work. And we started with radium fluoride, the simplest molecule that we can, we can do. And the idea was, OK, nothing is known. We have to really start from scratch. From scratch is really, from the very beginning, seeing the molecule, measuring all the degrees of freedom, and to give you an idea of how difficult it is when you compare with atoms, in atoms, we are mainly dealing with a two-level system. In molecules, you have vibrational, uh, vibrational degrees of freedom. And it's vibrational degree of freedom. And we have many states that correspond to the rotational degree of freedom. And it's rotational degree of freedom will have several states that correspond to the hyperfine interaction, right? the, the nucleus electron interaction. So overall, at room temperature, you can populate more than 10 to the power states, right? In atoms, you deal with two states. In molecules, you can easily do, deal with 10,000 states. And we said, nevertheless, let's start. We put this ambitious plan where we wanted to go step by step. And hopefully, one day, we'll measure the symmetry violating terms, parity violation and PT violation, or at least we will contribute towards this direction. And each time that you improve or you go to one of these degrees of freedom, you see the jump in precision that you need is about three orders of magnitude. So we're looking for tiny effects in, 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 in very large effects. But what also makes very special this molecule is they was predicted to be good for laser cooling. Laser cooling of atoms is a, is a very well-known technique, right? very well established. Laser cooling in molecules is fairly new. It's under development very mature, it started like 10 years ago, the first evidence. And in, in the same year, there was a proposal that this radium fluoride can be good for laser cooling. And this is great for two things. One, being good for laser cooling means that effectively works as a two level system. Although I can have many levels, it mainly works as a two level system 
which really facilitates the experiments that we are doing. And if you can do laser cooling, then it's great because you can think about performing extremely high precision experiments with these molecules in the long term. What it means to go, be good for laser cooling, as I said, to be a two-level system means that you have to have strong diagonal transitions. If you excite this state, it decays mainly back to the, to the same state. It means that the lifetime has to be short because you want to apply many photons and it, what we call an strong optical, optical pumping force. It's short, I mean nanoseconds. And we like to be isolated. So all electronic states to be above of this state that we don't lose population. And we say, okay, let's start. These are our long-term plans. And we did that. I will not go through the details of all the preparation. I will just jump directly into the results. And the plan was, or the plan is that we take this experiment at CERN, right? We have to produce these radioactive molecules. So we have this, this uh, PS be booster, then you, you send the proton beams with 1.4 GeV, you produce this radium fluoride. In, in our case, we did like, like offline. So first we irradiated, then we keep the, we kept the target for a while and then for like a month. And then we put in the, sold the target station where we can mix with CF4. And some chemistry happens and I pro, we produce radium fluoride plus. Now you must separate that you have to purify to be sure that you are mainly using the radium fluoride and no other contaminants. And this is producing a very hot environment, 2000 degrees. So this is really hot for a molecule. And then we need to do a pre-cooling. So we send it to a trap that is filled with a gas, in this case with room temperature. This is already cold for us. For, a, for an atomic physics, for a nuclear physics, room temperature is very cold. For an atomic physicist, it, it will be extremely hot. But it's called for us good enough to do the experiment. So we send these bunches of radium fluoride class. We are mainly interested in, in the neutral molecule. Then we need to neutralize the molecule somehow. And we do that with this standard technique that is colliding with a gas of sodium in this case. Sodium gives an electron to radium fluoride. And as a result, you have radium fluoride, hopefully mainly in the ground state. So you remove whatever was not neutralized, and once it's neutral, you can send the lasers to interact with radium fluoride. And at the end, you can put an, an electrostatic deflector to separate whatever is neutral and ionized. Now, how it works is you need at least two lasers in this CRIS technique. So one laser is, is used to excite the transition that you want to measure. And the second laser is used to take the electron from this excited level up to the continuum to ionize the molecule. So then in a typical experiment, you see the, the counts that you see in the detector. When the first laser is outside your resonance, hopefully you see zero counts, right? If you have zero background. And then you start scanning the laser step by step. And at some point when the laser is on resonance with this transition, you excite the electron to this level and the second laser has enough power to ionize. Then the neutral molecule becomes ionic molecule and then gets deflected. And you see an enhance of the count for the counts of the detector. And you continue doing that for all the levels that you want. So on paper, but you see, right, you do the, the similar case technique. What complicates that is that, that we didn't know each step of the experiment, right? It's, these are very fragile objects. We didn't know how many we produce. You are injecting molecules that are quite fragile into a gas, a high pressure gas at high energies. So all the steps of the experiment were unknown and we actually want to neutralize that again. So we want to collide with the gas at high energy as well. High energy in this case, 30 keV, which is high enough for, for this kind of AMO experiments. And then you can do the math. If you have 10 to the six molecules here, 10% efficiency in each of these process, and at room temperature, you populate them to the four states, then you can, from 10 to the six, you can end with only one molecule in the state that you want to start. So you really need very high sensitive techniques that have been possible only in very recent years. And what complicates a bit more this kind of experiments is that uh, we don't know the transitions, we don't know the lasers that we have to use. 
So we only have theoretical predictions. Probably in atoms, it's easy. You, you normally see in, an, in a table, and then you have a good idea where to scan. Here, we don't even know what lasers to use. But we have good theoretical predictions. Although good, they have a big uncertainty, 1,000 inverse centimeters. So it's hard to put that in a scale if you are not familiar. But it really means really a, a large space of unknown. So we typically scan like one megahertz per minute. If we are scanning 100 megahertz per minute, to cover all of this space mean many days, which make it practically impossible. We have to use different techniques to, or different approaches to what we normally use. One approach was to send many lasers and scan them at the same time, at least three lasers. And the advantage that collinearly, anti-collinearly, so we are seeing effectively six different lasers. So the molecule is seen in the rest frame, uh, six different lasers. So without going into more details, I jump in the results. The, the strategy turns out to be uh, to work very well and the theoretical predictions as well, right? So it guided us in, in, in a good way. So we saw the spectra. And what we are seeing here are the transitions between different vibrational states in the molecule. So now, this is great. So we are now having the low line structure of right and right. Goal one was accomplished. Now we want to see how is how two levels, how good is the approach, the approximation of a two-level system. Then we need to measure the non-diagonal transitions, and it turns out to be very weak. So in, in the language of molecular physics, the Frank Condon factor is very large, but it's quite diagonal. And we also measured the lifetime of that state, which in, was shorter than 50 nanoseconds. We put a limit, good news for laser cooling, and all the electronic states that we expected were above. So overall, it seems to be quite ideal for laser cooling. We didn't do laser cooling, right? But we have a, a good evidence that is good for that. And in the overall picture, we already measured the, the electronic and vibrational level. It's good to do laser cooling, and one, one postdoc uh, mentioned that. We are proving that, mentioned this sentence I like, we are proving that these hot molecules can, can be super cool. So the, the, our first results were published relatively recently. So we are happy that they got the attention not only from, from the physics community, but also from the chemistry community. And we have been approached by different groups, even for astrophysics, with, with some interesting uh, ideas. But we want to go beyond, right? This is just the, the first step in, in, in this goal. So we went to the rotational and hyperfine structure. But before we can play the games that we know how to play now, that we know how to create, uh, manipulate, and interrogate the molecule, we can do the game that we know how to play as a nuclear physicist and add neutrons into one of the nucleus of these molecules and see how the structure shift or how the structure of the molecule change. And to our surprise, the, and it was a good surprise, we already see at this very relatively low resolution, we clearly see these changes in the structure that depends mainly in a change on the nuclear size, really highlighting, highlighting how sensitive are these electron orbits in the molecule to changes in the nuclear part. So we have, it's really a very good molecule to test the, the electron nucleon interaction at the nucleus, right? We are interested mainly in the short range part. So more of this to come soon. And as I said, we want to go beyond. So we, we now went to high precision. We have some preliminary data when now we can do high precision. So imagine you now cut one of these regions to go and do high precision and measure the rotational structure. The jump between here and here is like two or three orders of magnitude in precision. And now you can actually replace the nucleus in the molecule by a nucleus with a spin different than zero and induce an hyperfine splitting. And now we are sensitive to that. So we proved that we can even measure the hyperfine splitting, jumping very close to our long-term goal. The step between here and here is a dramatic step. So it looks like we are already there, but it's a lot of work to do and a lot of developments in the techniques to really go to symmetry violating part, but it's already going in good direction. And, I'm, and we are very happy that it's progressing very well. So let me go to the summary of the presentation. First, this is exotic molecules. I think the main message is 
They can be very sensitive to the nuclear structure. They might have some advantages comparing with atoms. More important, so this was an I, well, equally important, and I, I don't know if I emphasize, that was the first ever laser spectroscopy of a short-lived radioactive molecule. So now we have this technique that we can use to measure many more molecules that are also of interest for nuclear physics and fundamental symmetries. And we are already uh, going at this precision. So it's really going uh, well in this direction towards our long-term goal. Also, what is quite unique and exciting for us is that molecules uh, seems to open this new window into the study of the atomic nucleus, mainly to the electroweak structure that so far is poorly known. So the nucleus spin dependent parity violation to observable like the anapole moment, it looks very possible in a near future. And in the long term, of course, we like to see to constrain parameters like the shift moment, right? We like to measure the actual shift moment, but that's far beyond, we need much more precision, but there are many ideas and interesting proposals to do that. I didn't have time to mention, but this is also interesting for astrophysics. And when we started the experiments, it was claimed that there was evidence of a of radioactive molecules in space. As no much is known, you have to, to really, you really depend on calculations to do any conclusions. So aluminum 26 fluoride is stable, 26 fluoride is radioactive, although the lifetime is 10 to the five years. Uh, that's stable for, for the standard nuclear physicists. But nevertheless, even for these long lived molecules, nothing was known. So you, you depend mainly on calculations. And it's interesting because the relative composition of those molecules in a space can tell you about when this astrophysical phenomena happens, for example, in time. So naturally, this is of interest for nuclear chemistry and uh, quantum chemistry, right? We are creating these highly relativistic systems. These are very rare matter that normally we don't find in the lab. So we are created here artificially and study them with high precision. So there is a lot to learn just from the quantum chemistry point of view. And with that, I would like to end and just to highlight that this is just the beginning, right? This was a, our proof of principle. This is something that we are just starting. Uh, we need new students. We, we need new people supporting this kind of work. And we are very welcome to, to new collaborations and, and really pushing this direction because we, we see a lot of potential. Thank you very much, Ronaldo, for a wonderful talk. And uh, we have uh, several questions in the chat line. So Alexis, do you want to go in with your question? Can the nuclei forming the molecule get excited by coupling to the electronic shells and how would such nuclear excitations impact on the observable? Okay, so the the question can be a bit tricky in general terms so the the scales of energy that, that we are speaking about here are let me just put a, a figure of a molecule okay so typical electron energy levels are electron volts right and the, the scale of nuclear you know very well kilo electron volts or, or or mega electron volts so in general no but yeah there might be some rare cases when this phenomena can be very interesting um, cases like thorium where, where you have similar energy scales in the nuclear excitation and the atomic and molecular excitation. That's all that I can say, right? I don't know. I know that there has been work trying to, to use actually that to control nuclei, but uh, it's far our expertise. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting field. Okay, we have another question from Dean Lee. Um, how well is the electronic structure of radium fluoride known and theoretically, and how important is it to have uh, all of the fine details understood? Uh, fine yes. Details. So yeah, this is also a good question. So let me go to this. So nowadays, we think, we believe in quantum chemistry calculations at the point of, at the precision of about 10%. So now, it looks when I show this figure, let me see if I if I go to this, I want to put the order for my okay here. So many times 
in doing the experiment, it's very important to guide the experiment, right? To choose the right molecule, we need to be sure that we are in the right hyperfine state. But once you experimentally know that in the experiment, what you do is taking relative measurements. So you sit in the same hyperfine state and look for an effect that you can change the electric field, magnetic fields, and subtract the differences. So you, in principle, in the experiment, you can throw away all of that. So you don't depend, it's not that you are looking for a small signal in a, in a very large number, but right, it's a relative signal. But we do depend, once you measure this, so let's say the structure then you can avoid like that. We depend on the quantum chemistry to guide us to actually uh, find the states and, and that we need to measure. Now at the very end, you will depend, once you measure something like, let's say the electron EDM, and let me go to this figure. So you measure this shift at the very end, you cancel out all the terms. So at the very end, you measure the, the product between the electron EDM, this observable and effective field in the molecule. And this is not an observable, of course, unfortunately. So we need to measure, we need to depend on, on theoretical calculations. At this point, the precision of 10, 15% is good enough because uh, if you measure anything different than zero, right, it's, it's already, uh, a sign of maybe new physics, so it's already exciting. But in the long term, to improve this precision, one way to do that is comparing with the hyperfine structure, because the structure of these operators are how well you know the, the electronic wave function at the nucleus. And the hyperfine structure is precisely that. So they depend very similar, these observables or these, uh, these, these parameters and the hyperfine structure. And the hyperfine structure is something that we can measure in the lab. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. I'm not sure we have any time for any more questions, but I only have one question, and that's about the next step. And I understand that there's talk of having this program mounted at the uh, aerial facility or ISEC facility at Triumph. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So we we actually want all facilities to to invest in this direction. So the next step uh, can go in many directions. So each step has to be improved, can be improved. We can imagine like having a cryogenic ion trap and it already improves here. We can actually use our molecules and perhaps let me go to this. They impact so many fields that ideally we dream with a facility in which you can control, produce the molecule send aluminum fluoride to study for astrophysics, for example, and there are many, many more cases that would be interesting. Doing very rare system for nuclear chemistry and the, the facilities for fundamental symmetries. There is a lot of nuclear structure to learn about that as well. So in the long picture, we bring with a facility dedicated to this kind to create the molecules in control environments and produce. Now in practical terms, what we need to do is to cool down the molecule to get high precision. And the step of that, the, the, the approach that we are following is now trying to actually do, use multiple lasers to, to pump into a given state and use cryogenic traps well, that we have not used so far to reduce the temperature of the molecule. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, talk and an exciting new field of uh, study.